your Bibles, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Obadiah? I know that is a one chapter book and the chances of you just opening it and it falling right there is slim to none. I've tried that. It's near Jonah and Micah uh, and uh, right before Jonah there, Obadiah is. So hopefully you can find it. It's toward the back end of the uh, Old Testament. Ms. Catherine Alvis was my second grade teacher, and I loved Ms. Alvis. Uh, she seemed really old, but she was probably about my age at the time, 50s. Uh, but what a sweet lady she was. She was a gentle and firm teacher, and we had a lot of fun in her class. The one thing, though, that I most remember from my second grade year, and I've shared this back a couple of years ago, was a recipe book that our class compiled in our own words with no help from adults. And it, I still remember it. I wish I could find it. There were some amusing recipes, especially when you consider they come from the mind of a second grader. And mine may have been the most funny. And it was this. I said, how to make hamburger. I had two steps uh, to the process. Kill a cow and put it in the oven. And uh, I didn't figure out how big an oven you needed or what we were going to do with the inedible and unacceptable parts. I just knew it came from cows, so kill a cow and put it in the oven. You know, we've been studying on Wednesday nights, uh, Erwin Lutzer, and uh, he is a great pastor and great writer. And we're studying his doctrinal study uh, on Wednesdays. But he wrote a book I read a couple of years ago. In fact, uh, the late Jim Wooden, who attended here, shared that book with me, and it's called When a Nation Forgets God. And Lutzer writes about Nazi Germany and where Nazi Germany went awry, where the nation of Germany really turned away from God. And we all know what happened as a result of that. Today, we're looking at Obadiah. And although it's a short book, it presents really a powerful and poignant message in the days in which we live. Because if we could summarize really what he's writing here in Obadiah, he is saying what happens when a nation turns against God. And uh, so I want you to look with me because the truths that we will see today and next week, I believe, are, are timeless truths. But... We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We're just going to read through verse 9 today, and then next week we'll hopefully pick up and finish this small book. Obadiah, verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your presumptuous heart has deceived you. You who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. If thieves came to you, if marauders by night, how ravaged you would be. Wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes? How Esau will be pillaged, his hidden treasures searched out. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau Timon, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we pray as we consider our own nation that, Lord, we as a people would heed the warnings from your word today. Father, we're individual members of not just this church, but our nation. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our nation Father, as we uh, look forward to the months ahead, 
We realize, Lord, the turmoil that may well lie ahead, but Father, help us to be an example of Christ's likeness, that Lord, you would be glorified, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. I think it's like the fourth or fifth shortest book in all of the Bible. It only has 440 words and 21 verses. Obadiah is the author of the book, but we know very little about him. There are 13 uh, men mentioned with the name Obadiah in the Bible, and we don't even know if uh, this Obadiah is one of those 13, but we do know a lot about the recipients of this prophecy. They were the Edomites. Edomites were descendants of Esau. You may remember Jacob and Esau. And Edom, Esau, it means red. And we know that uh, uh, Esau and Jacob were brothers and that Jacob through uh, guile was able to gain the birthright and the blessing from the father and the benefits of being the firstborn and how Esau was upset with him, Jacob fled. But as we read the story of Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis, we find out that before Esau passed, he made amends. He was reconciled to his brother Jacob and, and, and they were back in favor one with the other. But the problem is uh, Esau's descendants, the Edomites, did not follow suit. In fact, uh, they had perpetual enmity against Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. We see it from the time when uh, the, the people of Israel were making their way toward the promised land up to what we see here in Obadiah much later in Old Testament history. Edom itself was located on a, a rocky range of mountains east of the Arabah. Its territory was south of the people of God, Israel, where they were located, south of the Dead Sea. And uh, they were neighbors, but not congenial neighbors with God's people. It stretched about 100 miles, Edom did, to the north and south, and 20 miles uh, east and west. Some would say this book was written much earlier than I believe. They would say well, it was written probably in the mid-800s, but I think it's very clear that this book, this prophecy was given uh, in the early 500s, which again, you're counting back the other side of Christ's birth around the 580s uh, uh, BC. Um, and it was written uh, very similar to what we find in Jeremiah chapter 49, uh, as a prophecy, again, against Edom. This is going to be a two-week study for us. Next week, we're going to look at the primary reason I believe God gave this prophecy against Edom, and that had to do with its disregard for and agitation toward God's people, Israel. But today, I want to look at four things which Edom as, as a nation depended upon that would prove to be unreliable and lead to its fall. Now, let me offer this first. Today's message is not a political message. I think we can all agree there's no perfect political party. There's no one individual who's gonna be in power or come to power that is gonna save this nation. If we're looking for a party or a person to be our savior, then I think we'll learn today we're gravely mistaken. I'm not telling you to, to not vote. I'm not telling you avoid your convictions. As believers, we're called to vote. We're called to be responsible Christian citizens. But I'm just saying that the problems of our nation have not just been built in the last decade, but we've seen over a period of decades what happens when a nation begins to abandon God. And so today, what we're appealing is that we as a nation would return to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because whatever we would do, if we try to uh, align behind a political party or behind a political person, and our faith is in that, it's a misplaced faith. We saw last week God was not happy with those who rejected him. And so today we see the same thing, a repeat performance. In fact, we see that God is upset with Edom at the very beginning. He says, this is what the Lord God has said about Edom. Rise up, 
among the nations a messenger, rise up and let us go to war against him. There was an envoy of nations. They were called to go against Edom. And then what does God say? He says, they won't do it, but I will do it. I will make you insignificant among the nations and you will be deeply despised. He goes on as we look in, in uh, verses uh, 5 and 6 that his judgment on Edom would be a thorough judgment. He gives two illustrations. You know, if thieves came to you, uh, if martyrs by night, how ravaged you would be. But he said, wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? In other words, uh, uh, they come in, the thieves, they take what they want, and they would leave something. He says the same about grape pip pickers, those who came to the harvest, wouldn't they leave some grapes? But then he follows that by speaking about the judgment, how Esau, that is Edom, Esau and Edom are interchangeable words, how Edom will be pillaged, his hidden treasures were searched out. And so God was saying here, you, Edom, this nation that has turned against God, that is disregarding God's word, do you not know that judgment looms? You see, one of the many sins of Edom was that it had turned against God's chosen people, the Israelites. But I want you to see today that God, along with that, was most perturbed by the fact that they had demonstrated misplaced trust. They were not trusting in God. You know, earlier in Israel's history, not Edom's history, we read in 2 Kings chapter 18, when the evil king of Assyria, Sennacherib, had set himself against Judah. Now Assyria, which overthrew the northern kingdom Israel, set its sights on Hezekiah. And so the king sent a messenger to King Hezekiah with a threatening message. And so the spokesman who came to Hezekiah said, what are you relying on. Are you relying on that southern uh, nation of Egypt? And he described it, Egypt, as a splintered reed. Now, reed is like what you might find in a marsh or near the beach. It's the long, tall grass. And, and what he's saying, are you leaning on that? Are you leaning? That's not going to uphold you. And he was mocking Hezekiah, and he was mocking Judah, and he was saying, you think that Egypt is going to deliver you. Not only will it give way if you lean against it, but it will also splinter your hand. Little did he know that he was not a prophet, that spokesman, because we know that Hezekiah took that threat and he laid it down and he prayed and he proved that he leaned on the unshakable rock of God and God defeated and turned back the Assyrians. But Edom, here years later, these words fit them to a T because they were leaning on things that were not reliable. They as a nation were depending on four things that God says are giving way. And I wanna look at each of these splintered reeds upon which Edom was depending. The first is its geographical location. Notice what he says in verses three in four, he said, your presumptuous heart has deceived you. In other words, you're presuming that you're okay. You're presuming that you're secure. You who live, what, in the clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there will I bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. The Edomites, they lived in the highlands. Their territory seemed impregnable. 
Now, I'm not a military strategist, but if I were leading a military army, I would be very hesitant to, to take men or women, those who are involved in the military, to fight against people who were hidden in the mountains. Uh, for one thing, they would know the territory. For another thing, they would be looking down on me. Any battle, uh, just humanly speaking, that would be fought against the Edomites, those that would go against them would be at a great disadvantage. Edom geographically seems secure. And as I begin to think about Edom, I think about our United States. We have been blessed by God. Blessed. We have two vast oceans to the east and the west. Think about that for a moment. Really up to this point in history, now we're learning in, in this technological age, things have differed. But look over the years, and we have had, for the most part, benevolent neighbors to the south and to the north of us. Could you imagine some parts of the world where, where smaller nations that are surrounded by other nations that have animosity towards them? but not the United States. God has blessed us. It's not our doing. It is God who has blessed us. And Edom was blessed geographically, but they were not safe from the judgment of God because in one part, they were leaning upon the splintered reed of their geographical location. They thought we're untouchable, we're unreachable. But I want you to see a, a second thing. They depended upon its international coalitions. Look at verse 7. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. And it says, he will be unaware of it. We're living in a day to day where everyone is saying the United States needs a world coalition. We need to be united with other nations. We need to not be individualistic. And again, I'm not preaching nationalism, don't get me wrong. But, but there are people today that say we can't do anything unless we're in agreement with France or with England or whatever. Prophetically, that concerns me and scares me because I understand as the Antichrist comes, what he's going to do is he's going to unite a coalition of nations from the West. And so as we look at Edom here, Edom placed its trust in its international relations. It trusted its neighbors. They thought there was protection and alliances with other peoples, which, which understand if those nations were following God, that would have been a good thing. But the fact that they were uniting with nations that were not centered on, on God, there was a problem because people are people and nations are nations and people are fickle. And so God is saying here, those that you are relying upon, these international alliances that you have, guess what? They're going to drive you to the border. Uh, everyone at peace with you, they will deceive you. What he's saying is they're really looking out for their own interests, not your interests. And then he says, very interesting, those who eat bread with you will set a trap for you. In other words, all of this would happen without Edom being aware. Now, I'm not saying that international coalitions are wrong. I'm just saying we need to be careful of it. We need to be careful of it because international coalitions for Edom proved to be a splintered reed that not only gave way, but cut them. But I want you to see a third thing Edom depended upon. It's intellectual prowess. Look at verse 8. In that day, this is the Lord's de declaration. Will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau? So we see this. God is saying, okay, you depend upon uh, your you, you mountainous terrain and your geographical location. 
I can find you. He, he, he's saying you're depending upon your political alliances, but it's understood those alliances were not God led. He said uh, they will turn against you. And then he says, even your intellectual prowess, your, your wisdom will depart from you. Edom was known for its people of wisdom. Eliphaz, one of the counselors, if we could call him, call him that, of Job, was from Teman. And Teman was a group of people within Edom. Again, Teman would be interchanged often with Edomites, like we might say U.S. citizens are Americans. We know that Teman is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 49, a very similar prophecy here when God says that its wisdom would be removed. You know what I compare this to? It's a nation that depends solely upon its political consultants. It's not looking to God, it's looking for problem solvers in and around. Do we need wise people and authority? Most certainly. But here it's evident that in Edom, people were looking to people rather than to God. And God can remove counsel. God can confuse counsel for his purposes. He did it more than once in the Old Testament. And when the counsel of man is contrary to God's word, God can judge a people. In chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the church, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. And I want to tell you across both party lines, this is not a political message. This is just the truth. Both party lines, it seems over the past few decades, there's been a lack of godly wisdom and godly counsel. And it takes more than a platitude or more than someone just saying something that makes them think, makes people think that they're spiritual. God sees through it. And I speak across both ways. What we need are people of true godly wisdom in, in our, our leadership today. We need a Joseph in Egypt. We need a Daniel in Babylon. Men, uh, women, whoever is having the ear of our leaders to actually have wisdom and godly wisdom, not the intellect of man because God says uh, that God would remove those from influence. He would eliminate them, remove their understanding. Edom depended on its intellectual prowess. But I want you to see a fourth thing upon which Edom depended, its military might. Look at verse 9. It says, Teman, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. Boy, the first part of verse 9 sounds really unusual. Two words that don't seem to go together are warriors and terrified. But what God says is these military men, these people you're depending upon, these mighty men of valor, they will be terrified. The last splintered reed that is mentioned by Obadiah here is the power, the military power that Edom felt that it had. He says that it will be, they will be destroyed. The people will be destroyed by slaughter. And it did happen. Babylon, the empire who ransacked Judah to Edom's delight, would do the same with the Edomites. So here were the Edomites. The scripture says a proud and presumptuous people, depending upon their geographical location. We're not in the middle. We're not in the crossfire here. We're, we're above. We're okay. We're, where we're living, we're secure. Depending upon uh, political alliances. Oh, we've got friends in good places depending upon their own wisdom, their political consultants, the people who were giving the leaders words of wisdom, but it would be taken. And depending upon their international power or their national power, God says here, it's all like a splintered reed. It will give way. You know, whenever we look at a subject like this, I can be apprehensive. 
because I realize that if I preach it to somebody who's a Republican, they'll say, yeah, the Democrats need to hear this. And if I preach it to somebody who's a Democrat, they say the Republicans need to hear it. And, and that's a burden because many times when we look at that, one of the dangers, especially a, a message that's spoken to a nation is the blame game. But I'm telling you today, this is a blame game that has been building. And this is a problem that's been building over the years. The second is this, the thought, okay, this is a prophecy against a nation. We're a nation. I'm not in Richmond or north of Richmond. I don't have, barring from that song, I don't have contact. I don't have contact to the people. The second thing is I'm too tiny to do anything. The way I look at it for the church, we do two things, obey and pray. We just, we're studying Daniel. Daniel place was placed by God right where he needed to be. Same thing with Joseph. God can do it again. As the church, we're to be salt and light in our nation. Rather than looking at what Richmond or Washington needs to do, we need to be looking at our own circles. God said he would save Sodom if, if 10 righteous people could be found. The chances of our political officials hearing this not very great because we've got all of you here. I don't think any of y'all, the governor or the president are in either office, and we only have about five or 10 listen to us online. I don't think the president is listening to this. I don't think the governor is listening to this. But we're here. And we can make a difference where we are. We can obey and we can pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray godly wisdom. One thing is pray godly counselors. We're so often to blame an individual. Have you ever thought there are a plethora of individuals around our leaders in their ear all the time? Do you pray for them? Do you pray for them? Do you pray that God would give our governor, our, our president, our local leaders? Will you, will you surround them with, with good godly counsel? The beautiful thing about God's word, we read these Old Testament accounts and God does big things with a few people. He, he, you know, Gideon said, what can I do? God said, I'll show you, you take about 300 people and we'll defeat 160,000 Midianites. Now that doesn't make sense, but when God's in the equation, it always makes sense. So let's pray. I will confess all too often I can be sarcastic, I can be critical, but I wanna be different. I want us to be different. Our nation today is under attack from more areas than we can know, and I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. Let's pray. We don't need any splendid reeds in this day. You know, Edward Mode in the 1800s wrote the hymn, The Solid Rock. It's known by so many people. Edward Mote was a lay speaker, a lay leader in his church, would preach from time to time, a cabinet maker by trade. About a year before he died, he was no longer able to serve the church that he wanted. He was physically not able. But he said this about a year before he died. He said, the truths I've been preaching and I'm now living upon, they will do very well to die upon. You see, he wasn't leaning on splintered reeds or shifting sand. He was leaning on the rock. And thus he wrote, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We've been talking about our nation. We've been talking about an Old Testament nation, Edom. Let me ask you today, what are you leaning upon? Let me, let me say it more accurately. Whom are you leaning upon? Are you leaning upon the one who does not change, but who himself, as we saw today, changes the seasons? Are you leaning upon the one who is faithful, even when we might be faithless? Maybe today, the most important thing you need to do is say, I'm going to lean upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be today you would say, God, 
I've been basing my life, leaning my life on splintered reeds. And maybe you can go through maybe four, maybe more. You say, God, I want to lean upon the solid rock. Maybe today you need to say, Lord Jesus Christ, I know I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, I can't live this life in my own strength. I lean upon you. If you say that for the first time and confess your sin and repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You know, sometimes though in our lives, even as Christians, we can rely upon splintered reeds. We can rely upon our own strength, and I confess that. We can lean upon our own knowledge. We can lean upon our own understanding. We can lean upon our friends, and that's not bad, but it is bad if we lean upon our friends without leaning upon the Lord. Maybe today, you as an individual, we're not speaking with a nation here, we're speaking as an individual. You would say, Lord, I've been leaning on some splintered reeds, but you're my rock. I want to reaffirm your lordship. I want to lean on you. We're going to sing in just a moment, and our hymn is going to be number 275, I Surrender All. Maybe God has spoken to you today. I pray God has. And maybe you want to publicly respond, but however God leads, you come as we stand and sing number 275.